Hola, buenos dias. Uh, good morning. Just messing around with the guys of the simultaneous translation. I'll uh, speak in English. Um, I don't know we only have 20 minutes, but I want to have this uh, a little bit more interactive. So if you have one, any pressing question, just interrupt me and I'll go through the slides a little bit faster. Um, so uh, I will uh, mainly focus in my presentation on an overall overview of what are the current trends in what we call industrial biotechnology and the use of renewable resources for the production of various products that uh, Mary Carmen uh, has already alluded to. Um, so my presentation will focus on industrial biotechnology and the bioeconomy, uh, the importance of the choice of the feedstock that we're going to use in order to deploy these uh, opportunities and going beyond first generation feedstocks and I will uh, uh, address this with particular emphasis. Um, I will describe what the biorefinery concept is and finalize this uh, first uh, uh, slot of the presentation with examples of concepts which have already been uh, tested and actually implemented at least the demonstration scale uh, trying to uh, convert renewable resources into available products. And finally, of course, a commercial spot about my own company, Biotrend. So first of all, industrial biotechnology, what is the, this all about? Um, it's uh, basically um, trying to convert renewable resources into products using nature. So using nature as raw materials, using nature as catalyst to transform these raw materials into these products. And of course, to do that, we need to master not only the cultivation of the raw materials, but also all the processes uh, um, which are mainly performed by microorganisms or parts of microorganisms like enzymes, sometimes involving some uh, ancillary steps of thermochemical transformations or chemical transformations. But in the center, most often we have a fermentation process and we do need to know how to optimize this. And actually today we can produce all these products using only um, uh, biotechnology processes and renewable raw materials. In fact, if you look at the major components of biomass feedstocks, we can break these components down and produce uh, intermediate platform chemicals like sugars. Sh yes, sugar is a platform chemical. Sugar can give rise through transformations to a huge family of building blocks, which can then be recombined and finally go through all these processes and produce industrial products, products for the transportation industry, fibers, foods, feeds, materials, you name it. So all these products that we use today and that today are mainly derived from the petrochemical industry can be derived from renewable raw materials. This is possible today. This is not economically feasible today. So this is why it's important to have uh, projects like TransBio because we are trying to uh, narrow down the path between raw material to these very pro various products and more importantly to reduce the cost in order to render all these technologies competitive with the current petrochemical based industry and to bring these technologies to market. So what are the drivers? Um, we do want and the industry as a whole wants to reduce the dependence on all the right raw materials. You may argue why? Why now? Because this is not updated. It's true, it's not updated. Now the oil price is here. But imagine running a business which depends in the dynamics of the market, which is not your business. The chemical industry is dependent on the dynamics of the fuels market. Do you want to be dependent on the dynamics of the fuels market? I don't want to. Airlines have been bankrupting all over the, all over the world because they're deeply dependent on the pricing of oil. Most of them still exist because they're subsidized. So the chemical industry is struggling a lot. Now it's a good time for them because they can keep their margins. But when the oil price will surge again, and it will surge again, as we all know, then they will have their margins completely compressed because they cannot translate the increase of the price of their major raw material to the, to the pricing of their products because the, the demand will shrink a lot and they will have no business. So there's still an economic driver today even if the oil price is or has been in the last year quite low, but it will rise. But most importantly, ah, it works after all. 
we do know that um, the current raw materials will become exhausted uh, sooner than later. And we do know that, although some people claim uh, global warming does not exist, we do know, we all have a scientific uh, background here, we all know that there is an environmental challenge, a global environmental challenge that we need to address in order to lower our energy consumption and CO2 emissions. So this is the, these are the main drivers towards the change which, uh, uh, from uh, petrochemical raw materials to renewable raw materials. And this picture actually explains why. Uh, when you have CO2, it is captured uh, by a plant and the, the time span of a living plant and the average living plant is between one to 10 years. This captured uh, carbon is then, in order to be fossilized into the non-renewable non resources that we use today, it takes over one million years to do that. And then we pick up this carbon, which took one, more than one million years to be uh, uh, converted into the materials we're using today, and within one to 10 years, we use this old carbon. So we use, within one to 10 years, something that took more than one million years to uh, uh, to, 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 to happen. So this is clearly not sustainable. And the whole idea of using renewable carbon is to match the time span or, or the pace at which we are using our carbon to the pace at which the carbon is reconverted into this raw material. Um, this is not only a nice concept from scientists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You play in the lab, but now back to the real world. Yeah, the real world is actually following this. Uh, this is not a wishful thinking. These are projections from the United States Department of Agriculture uh, in which it is uh, predicted that uh, among the 3,000 billion U.S. dollars market, this is 3,000 million million, okay? Or 3 million million US, do U U.S. dollars per year of the chemical market, 25% uh, of these markets will have a bio-based origin. 25% will be bio-based in 2025. Um, the OECD has estimated that in 2030, 39% of the economic value of biotechnology will be on the industrial market, not on the health market, surprisingly. And this is not because the health markets are going down, but because the potential of the industrial applications of biotechnology are so huge and uh, uh, products with so much volume and so much impact can be produced that it will actually overtake the economic value on, uh, of the health applications of biotechnology. Uh, in 2003, there was a clear mismatch between the investment that was being made in uh, uh, biotechnology for industrial applications and the economic value. But again, uh, projects like TransBio and many other and uh, also uh, initiatives from the industry is clearly uh, closing the gap between research and the uh, later economic application. Of course, these volumes uh, are a little bit distorted by the promise of having biofuels uh, made from biological resources. It's a huge, huge market with many problems. I personally don't want to be involved in that market, but it's clearly one market we need to be, to, to, to be aware of. It's very important and it's actually setting the base of the all the technologies that we will require later on to produce chemicals, to produce uh, uh, additives, to produce polymers. Because a huge industrial capacity, a, a huge indus uh, industrial logistics capacity as well is being developed to address this market, which is the most challenging of, an, of them all. But it's not only biofuels. Um, you have platform chemicals, which are chemicals that can be later on used to produce other chemicals and so forth and intermediate bioreneable chemicals. And you'll find many different numbers in all the studies that have been performed. The only thing which is common to all these studies is the, sorry, is the trend. It's all rising and rising at a, a really nice pace. If you see on the bulk chemicals market, this is the overall increase of the market and this, this is the bio-based share. More than 27% a year increase. Specialty chemicals market. Uh, a nice market for 4.5% you'd like to have in your bank your money uh, yielding 4.5% 4, 4 each, uh, each year. So it's a, it's a very good market. But on the bio-based market, 
So it's really, it's really evolving. It's really going, going on. On the biopolymers and bioplastics, also a very nice market. So these are figures from the industry. This is not only uh, nice scientists playing in the lab. This is actually uh, uh, happening at this moment. And if you go to the supermarket, you already find products from consumer brands all over the world that do produce bio-based products. You had this, the uh, packaging of uh, Sun Chips in the US. Actually, this was a, a kind of a, uh, a problem because the, the noise of the package was so loud that people really tried to keep away from it. But actually, it's a, mar uh, a product that went to the market. You have lots of cutlery made of uh, polylactic acid or starch-based plastics. And these are substitutes of existing plastics. Uh, but probably the more important uh, contribution of the bio-based economy and actually the fast track to, to, to go to the market is to produce what we call the drop-ins, which is actually producing the same molecules that the chemical industry is used to today, uh, but through uh, using uh, renewable resources and through bi biotechnology methods. And there are already several products on the market. For example, there's a line from Pantene, Pant which already uses poly, uh, polyethylene uh, produced through renewable resources. Uh, there's a goal from Coca-Cola and Pepsi to have the 100% plant bottle uh, released in the market in the next couple of years. And you can have, it's still marginal, but still uh, but, uh, contributing to new applications and high-headed value applications. Uh, biotechnology has the, the, the potential to uh, uh, give rise to new products and new functionalities to to the market with new materials. There's, uh, there are companies which are, for example, exploiting the unique properties of spider silk to produce materials, extra resistant materials with really nice properties. Uh, if you look at the projections in terms of break, uh, breakdown, you have here the, the improved materials like the spider silk, the drop-ins, and the substitutions like PLA. And actually, the drop-ins are uh, predicted to be the major contributors to the, the rise of the uh, 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 bio-based materials in the market. But we then have a problem, a problem that has been quite uh, uh, clearly illustrated by the booming of the biofuels industry in the, in the last years. There's a problem with feedstock, okay? We need raw materials to produce our products. And most raw materials so far have been raw materials that do compete with food uh, applications, either by using the food itself, like corn, or by using land which is required to produce, uh, to otherwise produce food and feed. So this is not an uh, unsurmountable problem. We have many other materials to choose from. And if you compare the price of refined sugar it, with the price of uh, 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 byproducts of existing industries, you can see that these byproducts can be quite attractive from a price co cost of, uh, point of view. Uh, there is a challenge, although. It's kind of complex to transform this into this or to, into something that the microorganism then in a biological process can use. But the promise of producing waste, humans are very good at producing rubbish. And as more evolved humans are, apparently, they produce even more rubbish. So if you have the, uh, the, the average income is growing in the world, particularly in China and also in India, you'll have the... the, the, the tonnage of uh, municipal waste is increasing a lot. So there's a lot of opportunities and it's kind of our responsibility as well to look at these raw materials instead of more refined and noble raw materials to, to produce our, our uh, products. So this is today, first generation feedstocks competing with foods. They're really nice feedstocks to work with. They're really easy to work with. We can uh, quite uh, in a straightforward way use them to produce our products but they do have some social problems and we, they, they compete with food. And we, by using these products for industrial purpose, we might contribute for the price volatility of these raw materials. Today, there are many uh, attempts and actually many uh, uh, processes which are already implemented, at least at demonstration scale, using cellulosic raw materials, like uh, leftovers in the land, like forestry products, uh, and so on. These are really nice raw materials. They have low costs. They still, still have some important challenges to overcome, but which are being, uh, progresses are, are being made every, every year. Sorry. And finally, and more in the line of what is happening in TransBio as well, 
waste feedstocks, not only municipal solid waste, CO2 and flue gas are emerging as uh, two potential sources of carbon for uh, uh, biotechnology products, uh, processes. Just uh, a reminder and stressing that it's, there is a lot of non-used biomass in the world and even if you take into account that in the agricultural fields you need to leave some of the biomass residues on the field because it actually delivers nutrients to the field. There's been a study that even if we leave 75% of the non-used biomass on the field to be used as fertilizer, as a nutrition composition, you'll still have a huge amount of residues available to produce your products. So this, is, this doesn't seem to be a matter of having enough biomass available. It's more to develop the adequate technologies to convert this biomass, which is already available, into the products that we want. And this is where the biorefining concept comes from. So in order to get the biomass, you need to have a logistics not only of cultivation, of collecting the biomass and so forth. So uh, it, makes, it does make sense to couple these industrial activities with the existing activities that already generate and collect that biomass. So in the, it's, uh, uh, the concept of biorefinery takes the whole plant and fraction, fractionates the plant First, extracting the more valuable products like food and feed, then going to the residues which cannot be used as food and feed and produce materials, chemicals, and ultimately uh, energy. Um, again, this is not uh, just a concept. There are many examples already out there. You can use lignosolasic residues. You can use cheese whey. Uh, glycerol as a byproduct of biodiesel, it's a very nice carbon source. Normally uh, it has some contaminants you need to deal with, but it's a very good carbon source and even wastewater sludge. And this is actually, as you will see through the day, uh, tra Transbio's contribution to the core of this objective. Uh, this is just uh, a couple, these are just a couple of ex examples. So you can use lignocellulosic residues uh, lignocellulosic hydrolysate, which are carbon rich, and mix them with nitrogen sources and just grow bugs that do accumulate polyesters uh, from them. Um, you can use the same raw materials to, with lactic acid bacteria, and what you'll have is a process in which you will produce lactic acid, and you can have a continuous process in which the cells are retained here in the reactor, and you have a cell free stream towards lactic acid purification. And this highlights the, the, the concept that you're using free carbon from the uh, surrounding air, which is captured through photosynthesis by the plant biomass. The plant biomass is then fractionated. The sugar fraction is fermented. The, in the fermentation broth, then you extract your uh, compound of interest. You have a bio-based monomer, which is then polymerized to produce your polylactic acid, which then goes into the various applications that we've seen of packaging. And it has started as the production of lactic acid, which was used as a food ingredient or disinfectant. Then, hey, we can polymerize this. Let's do some polymers. And they started to produce some disposable uh, products, not very much high value, uh, but uh, uh, still with a nice environmental goal that the, 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 the polymers are degradable, so you can use it as disposable. But this is quite cheap. If you look at the presentations from Corbion, which was a Purak um, in the, uh, the latest years, they started with this type of products, then which were totally disposables. Then they've been developing some new applications which are rendering all these products durable. And today you actually find some components made of polylactic acid and composites of polylactic acid in high hand, uh, high resisting uh, uh, and high impact demanding applications. And of course, the price for these products is much higher than these products. So this is just to show that you have also in the development of specific product, you have a life cycle. You develop the product as such that will be used in the known uses of that product. And then you will have a stage all of, through the years in which you'll find new applications and possibly new added value applications that will uh, build on your original business. This is just another example from 
carbon photosynthesis, bioethanol, bioethanol to polyethylene. This is on the market. Um, the use of cheese whey, I know it's a, it's a concern in the north of Spain. There were, I don't know how it is today, but there, there, was, a, the, the, there was a problem of disposable of the cheese factories. And this can be also used to produce polylactic acid or ethanol as well. The example of converting crude glycerol into various, various products through fermentation. And the same concept can be applied to uh, wastewater. You can also produce, for example, polyhydroxalkanoates uh, using wastewater as, as, uh, as treatment and then use uh, these polymers in various applications as you will see later on. And the, the advantage of using mixed cultures here as uh, opposing to the previous examples in which you have one culture only is that you have the potential to use varying compositions of your, of your waste. So this is, would, would be more uh, suitable for a community in which we have mixed activities, mixed small activities going on. So today you have chemicals produced by chemical companies and research being performed on the bio-based uh, uh, sector. In the future, you'll have chemicals produced by the chemical companies as well, but a significant fraction of the, uh, these chemicals will also in parallel be produced by the bio-based uh, industry. And again, you'll have this bio-based industry to have the potential to reach all these markets. This is a, an example of succinic acid, one of the building blocks which is uh, targeted in TransBio. And you can see the, the range of applications that currently are already being uh, deployed using bio-based succinic acid. It's uh, tremendous. Uh, this will not happen uh, overnight, but we can and we should uh, take advantage of uh, existing industrial capacity. And this is uh, just an example of using, for example, uh, traditional pulp and paper mills, which have already a logistics of supply of raw material that already have a, a significant industrial capacity for the production of their main product, pulp and secondary product, which is electricity. But a lot of residues are being generated that can be uh, uh, converted into various bioproducts and above all, uh, also, taking into advantage the logistics which is implemented, the excess heat which is generated typically in these plants which can uh, lead to very uh, interesting uh, energy integrations between the existing infrastructure and the infrastructure which is needed to be deployed in order to produce the bioproduct. And just a couple of words about biotrends. So we are trying to contribute to make this all happen. We are a bioprocess development, optimization and scale-up company. Uh, based in Portugal, in addition to our most important assets, which are the highly qualified people. Uh, we operate a state-of-the-art facility for bioprocess development, so we can develop processes from 1 milliliter to 250 liter scale within our facilities. And we have partnerships with a, a local company, contract manufacturing company, and we can go to 100 cubic meters so we can support our clients across a, a a meaningful range of capacities. Uh, we are not specialized in a particular organism or a particular raw material. As you see here, we have been working with many, many different systems, and um, which is kind of fun, real, real raw materials. So it's not only sugar solutions, it's actual residues, actual industrial <coughs> streams, which are provided by, by our clients. And this is a typical example of what you do. The clients knocked at our door, they had the process lying here, and after two trials, we increased the productivity uh, more than 40-fold for our client. Uh, this is uh, uh, something that we did for an enzyme engineering company. They were already on the market. This is the production cost when they started working with us. This is the production cost today, and this is implemented at 150 cubic meter level, so imagine the uh, the benefit that you've driven for, for this client. We also participate a lot in uh, uh, research projects like TransBio. It's good for, to have our staff uh, being exposed at the latest developments and also to showcase our, our own competences. And if uh, by <coughs> any chance you are in the vicinity of Coimbra, we are located here in Cantanhede and you're most welcome to visiting us. Thank you very much.